from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. It is uh, a high personal privilege, as they say when they introduce the President of the State of the Union message, for me to have as our guest for this broadcast my dear friend Joe Sobert. And uh, I was looking over some Sobert materials before the broadcast, and there's a quote uh, from uh, Sheldon Richmond, who was editor of The Freeman, uh, in which uh, Richmond said, No one so explicitly or deftly connects what is happening in the world today to the loss of our freedom and systematic usurpations of a government. Absolutely no one. Sobern is a cross between Mencken, Nock, and Cato's letters. Now, we have a very literate audience, and I'm sure you all know uh, who H.L. Uh, Mencken was, Henry Louis Mencken. Some of you may know who Nock was, and of course anyone who ever took Latin knows who Cato was. Well, I went to the Boston Latin School. I took six years of Latin, some of which rubbed off, but not as much as my masters would have preferred. And when I became director of the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity, I had a, a sign on the board behind my desk uh, quoting Cato as saying, Carthago delendum est, and that great society agency was Carthage. Joe, you have done many things. Uh, you're the author of many books. You're the principal uh, defender of the real author of uh, the works of Shakespeare. Uh, your columns appear regularly in The Wanderer. You've got a twice-weekly column. You've got a uh, newsletter, which I guess is monthly, called Sobrans. I see your articles pop up elsewhere. I think in Chronicles magazine is, is one of those uh, where your work appears. And... Uh, it is consistently eloquent, uh, insightful, and unique. And I always uh, rejoice in the opportunity to, to read your columns. And one of the things I'd like you to get into, I know you're a very devout Catholic, was a wonderful column that I just read of you about the Vatican and about the changes which have been made by Pope Benedict. And uh, my wife is Catholic. And I, I shared your column uh, with her, and I thought you made some excellent points. You might want to recount them for our uh, viewers. I could barely remember. I was tempted. Well, to... you talked about Pope John the Twenty yeah. Third, and uh, you talked about uh, the Tridentine Mass, yeah. and you talked about uh, how the the changes yeah. led to the abortion push, led to other things. Yeah, I think the, something uh, vital, a gravitational pull, went out of the Catholic Church and also Christendom in general with the Second Vatican Council because it was immediately assumed that the Church was really going to liberalize and should liberalize. And all sorts of people were predicting more changes in that direction very expectantly and it horrified me I'd fallen away from the church already at that age and yet I didn't want that beauty that beautiful thing to be destroyed and uh, so many people were eager for it and I you know I went to the new mass when it arrived and I was horrified it was I thought it where am I? Is this a Unitarian church or a Catholic church? Uh, which reminds me, I always say that the U.S. Constitution bears the same relation to the U.S. government that the Book of Revelation bears to the Unitarian church. But anyway, that's kind of irrelevant here. But anyway, here, I was converted to the Catholic church because it was so beautiful and it was awesome. And it held the line on all kinds of things when others wouldn't, birth control especially. And this is the one thing that I find incredible. You'd think with Europe now declining in population that people would look and say, hey, 
that old pope was right. Pope Paul VI, the weak liberal pope, we thought, but he wouldn't give an inch on contraception. And now look, we were we were always told in those days about the quote population explosion. I don't see any population explosion of Christians in Europe. Uh, that's all over. It's it's horrible the prospect of decline. And uh, when I was a kid, we thought big families were wonderful. Every time a baby was born, the whole neighborhood celebrated. That was the way life was, you know, be fruitful and multiply. And suddenly, we were told this, this was socially irresponsible. And all the wisest people were telling us, you know, that we had to have birth control and contraception. You remember when the Lambeth Conference of 1931 approved of contraception for very narrow purposes, only, of course, between you know married people in facing some kind of hardship. There were howls of outrage from all Christendom. And today, the exception has become the rule. Contraception has become a duty. I mean, if the Lambeth Conference had known that what it did would lead to contraceptives being given out in schools, what would they have said? And uh, Laura Bush uh, presenting some to her husband as a birthday present. Recently. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. The uh, what was it again? I mean, uh, the remind me yeah. of the occasion. The Lambeth Conference. And oh. Her doing it. Oh, this, it was his 61st birthday. Well, the Bushes have always been great Planned Parenthood people. Yes, as a matter of fact, his grandmother, Dorothy Walker, was a colleague of Margaret Sanger. Oh. And okay. uh, worked with her in organizing Planned Parenthood. Progressive-minded people. Huh? And, of course, his dad, when he was a member of Congress from Houston, George Herbert Walker Bush, was given the uh, uh, name, the, the nickname by Wilbur Mills, of Rubbers Bush, because he was the one who introduced the legislation uh, that led to Title X and so-called family I didn't know that. Oh yeah, Rubbers Bush, oh. the forty-first president of the United States. Oh dear. Well, <laughs> I think they've already started rewriting the history books in that respect, haven't yeah. they? They, have. they don't remind us very often. That's that's the thing, though. I mean, you'd think now people in general would look. I, re I remember a, an Indian friend telling me that the Muslims and Hindus in India were horrified by the idea of contraception, which was being pushed by the U.S. in those days. Still is, I suppose. But uh, anyway, well, this Bush has been a little better on those things, hasn't he? Well, I'm not sure. I don't, uh, on, in some ways, yes, but Planned Parenthood receives more money uh, thanks to the signature of George Bush, still under his presidency, than it did under Bill Clinton's presidency. Oh my gosh! So there are all kinds of things. Well, let's talk politics for a bit. You're, uh, you've been uh, a very wry observer of the political scene in your Wanderer column, and uh, you and I share an admiration for Congressman Ron Paul, and you express the hope that if he doesn't receive the Republican nomination. He'll seek the nomination of the Constitution Party. Oh, I'd love to see that. Wouldn't that be something? That would be great. One thing I'd like to interject. A couple of years ago, I had lunch with two very conservative friends on an election day, an off-year election. And uh, none of us has ever voted for a Democrat. And yet we all agreed that this Bush makes the Clinton era seem like a golden age of conservatism. And, you know, we were not joking. We were not joking. Clinton, the, the level of spending and the at least refraining from really overt war. You know, and well, we, we wouldn't have entered Iraq under a Clinton presidency. That's true, not the way we have now. Spending was less. Gridlock work to the country's advantage because Republicans opposed on partisan grounds things that Clinton yeah. proposed that they right. support on partisan grounds under Bush. Gridlock is sort of 
Our substitute for constitutional yeah. government, isn't it? Absolutely. Joe, we have to take a break. When we come back, I want uh, to get your comments on latest developments in the theatrical world. To get up with the current scene uh, here in the D.C. area, they're now producing uh, Shakespeare plays totally in the nude. You may have read about yeah, that. Uh, yeah. And we'll get your comments when we get back. Since the presidency of George H.W. Bush, the father of the incumbent, we've heard a great deal of talk about something called the New World Order. This is something of which every American should be wary, because what it means is the transfer of control over our tax dollars and the setting of policies which affect us from an electorally accountable Congress to international bureaucracies over which we have no real control. Work with the Conservative Caucus in defeating the goals of the New World Order and restoring accountable, limited constitutional government in America. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and our guest is Joe Sobrin. Joe is uh, an expert on many things, a jack-of-all-trades and a master of all. And uh, he's doing a book on Abraham Lincoln at the moment. Joe, there have been many books uh, written about Mr. Lincoln. What this do you is have the to... first all-nude book. Aha. Uh -huh. Taking a, a page from Macbeth. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to get into that later. What do you think of them performing Macbeth in the Nude? As they did, uh, a production of the Washington Shakespeare Company, everyone in the cast was buck naked. Well, I won't even, I won't even watch a talk show where they don't wear neckties, so I'm yeah. not going to go for that, am I? Well, actually, they smeared them with mud. <laughs> so that was in, in lieu of a necktie. Uh, Apparently, it was a sellout crowd. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh that. dear, that's that's so, it's so ridiculous. It adds nothing to the. Well, they'll do anything for a laugh, I guess. <laughs> well, tell me about Lincoln. Why do we need another book about Abraham Lincoln? Well, because he's so deified. He's like a Roman emperor. Um, when people say Bush was our worst president, I always want to defend him. I want to say you're forgetting Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt. It's hard. And Woodrow to... Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. But uh, Roosevelt was a contemptible man. Lincoln had personal qualities and eloquence. He didn't need speechwriters. So I, I, I don't know if this makes him better or worse, but certainly he, he's more due for a deflation than anyone else. At least we haven't put Roosevelt on quite so much of our money. Uh, but... Lincoln. Of course, you know, those pennies aren't worth as much as they were. No, <laughs> thanks to the others. I mean, yeah. yeah. And the they, dimes are going downhill. They've even made it hard to decide by what criterion we should say worst. Yeah. That's how bad it's gotten. After Lincoln, the Constitution meant nothing. The Constitution became whatever the federal government said it was. And without, people forget that without Lincoln, we could never have had Roe v. Wade. Because if the states had still had the right to withdraw from the Union, being free and independent states, that's what a state by definition is, then, uh, you know, the minute the federal government attempted any of these horrible presumptions, several states would have walked. You know, even Lincoln was uh, checked on the income tax. Right. He had to pull back on that 
And it wasn't until the era of William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson that the federal income tax that's true. came in. That's true. That's true. But uh, nevertheless, the, the defeat of the states, the defeat of the states' right to autonomy meant the, the end of the original constitutional And, of course, system. a lot of that was the 14th Amendment, yes. which came right after Lincoln. That, too. But still... It was the war that did it. No yeah. state could even think of seceding anymore. And uh, the word secession now has become associated wrongly with slavery, even though, of course, some of the s northern states had wanted to secede first. In fact, threats of secession were very common before Lincoln. Did you see the movie Gangs of New York? Yes. I thought they did a good job. Was it Scorsese who produced that? They did a good job in showing the hostility to, to Lincoln in New York State. Right, right. That was very good. And they also showed the way in which Indian immigrants were slaughtered. They got off the boat and were sent down as cannon fodder wow. uh, in the uh, War of Northern Aggression. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, Joe, let me ask you a question. What do Alexander Hamilton, Abraham Lincoln, and Bill Clinton all have in common? Go ahead. They were all illegitimate. Oh, that's true. I hope in your book you'll make some, and I think that is the spawn of overweening ambition, uh. the desire to prove one's worth. Lincoln was really the son of Abraham Enloe. His mother, Nancy Hanks, was impregnated by Enloe. She was a, a hired hand in the Enloe uh. residence, and uh, her mother had been illegitimate as well. Lincoln said this was the deepest, darkest secret of his life. He confided that to E.W. Scripps. Willie Herndon, in his book, Herndon's Lincoln, devoted the first chapter to the Enloe connection. And then when they were doing a hagiography on Lincoln, the Republicans excised the first chapter. I did and if you that. get a copy of that original uh, Herndon's Lincoln, uh, you can make a fortune on it. Wow. I was initially skeptical of this whole idea until I saw a book called The Genesis of Lincoln, which had pictures not only of Lincoln, but of Abraham Enloe and Enloe's other children. And the other children looked like Lincoln. They had the same extended hands. And uh, there was a daughter who was as ugly as Lincoln. Wow. And they all had Marfan syndrome, which was a disease that afflicted Lincoln. So that was what persuaded me. And uh, it isn't much discussed today, but that was an issue yeah. when Lincoln first uh, sought the presidency in 1860. Oh, I didn't know that. And, of course, Bill Clinton was uh, that way, and uh, Alexander Hamilton was called the bastard brat of the Scotch peddler. And they were all driven to intellectual achievement and uh, a driving ambition, every one of them. Yeah. Oh, well. well, now, let me give you a chance in the, uh, in the time left to us uh, to make the case for the fact that the real author of the works that we call Shakespeare's, uh, is a man called De Vere, the Earl of Oxford. Edward De Vere, yes. Tell us. I think if you study the sonnets closely, you see that the author gives himself away in writing to his young friend as an older man, a man of rank, a man who's come into disgrace, a man who's lame, as Oxford described himself in his letters, and so forth. There's... There are a number of little giveaways like that that simply cannot be squared with the Stratford man. The Stratford man being William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was the, the way the name was spelled. Shakespeare. In fact, I've written a novel about it. And uh, probably the only humorous novel written about Shakespeare, that he's the only one I know of. Uh, it's called I, Shakespeare. And, <laughs> and in it, Shakespeare is the, is the hard-boiled detective who has to figure out who's writing all these plays with his name on them. So it has a it has a pretty neat premise. He has to go around to Francis Bacon and Christopher Marlowe and the Earl of Oxford, demanding information, trying to figure out who's doing this, especially since these plays are getting him in all kinds of trouble. And uh, anyway, I had a lot of fun with it. And everyone who's read it loves it. I must say, I'll send it to you. Please, please. It's a two-hour read. I mean, 
I wanted it to read faster than a Reader's Digest condensed novel. And, <laughs> and I can say that for it, at least it does. There are 30 sub-characters in 80 pages. So all of the evidence suggests that Shakespeare could not have written the yeah. plays attributed to him, and that uh, De Vere is the likeliest candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, even, in fact, one of the... Uh, one of the aspects of the sonnet, which the gay movement loves, to bring up the, uh, but the author is obviously in love with this young man, testifies for De Vere too, because that's what he was accused of. So, you know, take it all together, there's a, I mean, I think an overwhelming case for De Vere, except for one problem, which is that all the experts have so much invested, it's like the Republican Party, how are you going to get the Republican Party to read the Constitution now? They've got too much invested in the phony one, in the living document. Well, it's the same with the Shakespeare experts. They have so much invested in the supposed author, they do not welcome any inquiry about who the real author was. And it shows most of all in this treatment of the sonnets. Now, I recognize that, that you don't need company if you're right. And, uh, and I support your position on this. But are there any students of Shakespeare who uh, corroborate or agree with what you have argued? Well, I think a quietly growing number, and a lot of actors. Lawrence really? Olivier did, I've told Lawrence you. Olivier. Yeah. John Gilgood. Michael York, who was just here in Apparently he did very well in Camelot. Camelot. Yeah, I wish I'd seen it. I, I'd love I to saw the it. original on opening night in Boston with Richard Burton, ah. Julie Andrews, Robert Goulet, oh, wow. and uh, Roddy McDowell. I was first row mezzanine, and I said, this what is a an historic moment. It was. What a phenomenal production that was. Yes. It was great. But I understand Michael York is the first guy since Burton to really do it justice. Wow. So it, grieved me, it grieved me when they put that scoundrel in the movie version. Of Camelot, whoever it was. Richard Harris? Yeah. He did a terrible job. Oh, I didn't see it, yeah. but uh, uh, Sir Derek Jacobi is also an Oxfordian. What a... Is he really? A great, great Tremendous actor. Tremendous actor. I will always remember I, Claudius, one of the greatest series ever to appear on the television screen. I loved him as Claudius in Kenneth Branagh's otherwise yes. not very good Hamlet. Yes. He speaks every line so intelligently. You can know the play by heart. And you will learn about it from listening to Jacoby speak. We have to take a break now. Uh, I have a son who may be playing Henry V in uh, a college production. And I'd be interested when we come back in your analysis of uh, Branagh's production of Henry V. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. The Conservative Caucus is working to raise up a new generation of leaders who understand the principles of the Founding Fathers as set forth in the Constitution of the United States. In Article I, Section 8, it says, Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin and to fix the standard of weights and measures. Congress has abdicated that duty, that responsibility, to the Federal Reserve which now, by inflating the money supply on a continuing basis, each day taxes us more than Congress does by diminishing the value of our savings and our earnings. The Conservative Caucus, almost alone among national conservative organizations, is working to restore constitutional government, whether the issue is money or something else find curious facts from america's past at loc.gov the library of congress website come on you're going to tell me that buying one imported towel is going to cost someone their job ever tried shopping for clothes with a four-year-old i can't be looking for where the stuff is made since 1980 nearly half a million americans who make apparel and home fashions have lost their jobs even though the quality of our products is second to none which makes you wonder if it's foreign competition that's hurting us. So the shirt's imported. Who's it going to hurt? Or if it's us that's hurting us. Buy American and Americans work. 
Welcome back. Thank you for watching this edition of Conservative Roundtable. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please check out the website of the Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org, or you can contact our executive producer, Arthur Harmon, at, uh, by faxing him at 703-281-4108. And our address, of course, is 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Joe, we have uh, just a couple of minutes left. There's probably uh, no one who combines an interest uh, with politics, theology, public affairs, and Shakespeare as do you. What uh, enraptured you with Shakespeare? And uh, try to tell us in a minute or less. Well, I saw Macbeth on TV with Morris Evans and Judith Anderson. I, had, I saw the same thing. Yeah, well, I thought it was pronounced Maurice, but I'm wrong. I Who knows? Whatever. Be. It's been so long since anyone's heard of him, you know. But uh, anyway, I saw that production, and Judith Anderson, better known as Mrs. Danvers and Rebecca, was the most amazing thing. And the language, I've never gotten over the language of Macbeth. I think that's the greatest poem Shakespeare wrote for sheer, I mean. It, well, you, you're keeping the love alive and you're sharing it with a new generation. And that's very important. I know when they study Shakespeare in high school, they don't really know it. It's a burden, not a blessing. Yeah. But it is a blessing. And thanks to you, more people would appreciate oh, the blessing. Joe Sobern, thanks so much for Howard, all you do. thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us. I'm proud to share a zip code with you now. Hey, Joe is now a neighbor of the Conservative Caucus in Vienna, Virginia. Thanks for watching.